Eu falo inglês. Eu falo como cinco palavras de português e 20 palavras de espanhol. Então, eu falo português muito mal. Vou apresentar em inglês. É melhor, muito melhor. Se tem uma pergunta, pergunta-me em português e Rich will respond. <laughs> ok? Alright, let's go. I was asked to kind of give an overview of where we are and kind of give you, there's lots of sessions on open uh, educational resources, both today and tomorrow, and I want to try to give a context for that. And so I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the growth of online education. Uh, I'm going to focus on the United States because that's where I know, that it, and if you can help me understand the growth of online education here in Brazil, I think that that would be fascinating for me. Uh, I want to then talk about what, what is it that we use for online education and where does open educational resources fit into that, and then we'll talk a little bit about the open educational resources we've been working on for the past, we've been engaging in this at least in conversation for at least eight years. Okay, so let's start with some perguntas, if I can click the right button. So, how many of you are from a university? Basil Bowl, Rich, you from a university? Oh. Yeah. School. So if you are, does your university offer any online class? Yeah. So, it, ha, then the next question is, have you ever used anything like Blackboard or Moodle or any of the LMSs out there? So, so you've used some of those tools? Moodle? Blackboard. Moodle. So the, the really cool thing about open educational resources, it fits really nicely with open, um, open software. And so Moodle is, is an open source software program. Um, so, so open educational resources followed the open source movement. And so it's another opportunity to, to make things so, so good. A knowledgeable audience. Um, have you ever taught a com course completely online before? Really? Awesome. No? Completely. No? A lot? Muito? No. Uh, half. Half. So, half. That's where I started, is teaching a little bit online and a little bit face-to-face. -face. Uh, but I taught my first online class in 1998. And now, almost all of my master's degree classes that I teach are online. My PhD classes tend to be seminars that are very small and very face-to-face. -face, but my master's degree courses are all online. All right, so what's happening in the United States? I can't read that because it's in Portuguese. I read it over here. Skip ahead. So 65% of higher education is, is considering online a crucial part, a critical part of what they need to do. Uh, my university is behind a lot of other universities. My university was started in 1785. It's been around for a long time. They have a big, beautiful campus with big, beautiful buildings. In fact, we, our president, our Hector, just retired. He's been, a, he's been the president for 15 years. And one of the statements as he was leaving is that he put $58 billion into more buildings on campus in the 15 years he's been president. So it is a brick and mortar campus. It is a huge campus. There are 35,000 students that go there. It's a big, beautiful campus, but and they're, they're way behind all the other universities, but they opened their online education office this fall. So they recognize that online is important. I think if you open it right ghosts, ghosts, fantasmas. <laughs> so, so we think that online education is really important. Our master's degrees are online. You can take, you can get your master's degree from the University of Georgia in learning design and technology, completely online. And and we're one of the few programs that do that. There are lots of universities that are that are doing online. So the, this is some data that's kind of old. It's from 2000 that they're estimating in the fall of, of 2010, not 2011, that 6.1 million students were taking at least one online class. So, and now with MOOCs, that number's gotta be way bigger. So there are a ton of people taking online. When we first started teaching online, what we did is we designed our curriculum so that half the courses were online and half the course, where I live in, in the state of Georgia, we're in a kind of a, a smaller town about an hour and a half from Atlanta. Atlanta is the largest city in the state of Georgia and so it's it's difficult for students to commute from Atlanta because it's an hour and a half away so we opened a campus in Atlanta 
and we would teach half of our classes in that campus in Atlanta and half the classes and the students online. really like that and I think that the same thing happened with the University of Phoenix University of Phoenix offered all their courses online but students wanted face-to-face -face classes so they opened classrooms in um, shopping centers all over the country, well, all over the world. And that way students could take some of their classes face-to-face -face at, a, at a small local shopping center and some of their classes online. Well, they're now closing down all those shopping centers because people have evolved to the point where they want all of their classes completely online. So, so this, the, the movement is even more towards online. Uh, MOOCs, you know, the first MOOC at, at Stanford had 100,000 students with Coursera. The, the number of students in the Coursera class, you all heard of Coursera? Coursera, the, the typical class has at least 50,000 students. They have a lot, anybody ever take a Coursera course? Coursera, one? Coursera, no? I took one, and I was like most of the people. I signed up for it, I did the first couple videos and the first couple of readings, participated in the first discussion, and then got busy with my other things that I had to do and never did anything else. So a huge number of people actually dropped out of those MOOCs. It's cool that it's free. It's cool that you can take a class with 100,000 people from all over the world, but... Um, so, so, so we teach, all, I teach, on, I've been teaching online since 1998. I start my class with 30 students, and I end my class with 30. So they start with 100,000 students, they end with 4,000 students. I, I can't, my university would not accept that big of a dropout for, for a, a real graduate class. You can't teach a class like that. Is it a regular class? Hmm? Uh, when they, they did the book, yeah. they registered as a regular class? You can get, well, it depends on what you, well, it feeds into my next slide, so I'll answer that when I turn the slide. So the, uh, let me make this last point, and that, in the United States there has been schools like University of Phoenix, there's a bunch of them ha that have emerged that are for-profit universities. They charge the same amount of tuition as like Harvard does, but the education is not the same as a Harvard education. It's very expensive and they make a lot of money. In fact, I work with one of those, one of those for-profit universities and they asked me how much does our president make and our president makes maybe $300,000 a year and they laughed at me. They said, our president makes three million plus plus bonuses, and so, so they didn't think that it was great that my president made only 300, I, I'd be happy with $300,000, but they, they, they thought it was bad that our president made such a small amount of money. And the for-profits, they're making a ton of money. And so, so this push is pushing the rest of the more traditional universities to really want to do some stuff online. There's this demand, now they're trying to meet that to me. So what your question was, is it a real class? And that's the thing, is there's, there is something called uh, graduate, university graduate credit or, or regular course credit. Then there's something called continuing ed credit. A lot of the universities like MIT, they don't offer, if you go to MITx, you don't get a university credit, you get a continuing ed credit for that. And you have to pay to get that continuing ed credit. You have to pay to take the test, and then, and then you're granted the continuing ed credit. What is continuing ed credit? What's the value of continuing ed credit? Well, right now, now there, are, there are certain professions that require continuing ed credits. For example, medical doctors have to have a certain number of continuing ed credits every year. So they have to, and so taking an MITx medical focus course, they absolutely would want to do that because they have to get, I don't know, 10 CEUs or in the medical field that's called, um, not continuing ed, but medical, uh, MCU, medical continuing, I can't remember the abbreviation. But they have, teachers often have to have a certain number, a lot of the professions require a certain number of continuing ed credits to maintain their licensing. So lawyers, doctors, teachers all have to have that continuing ed credit. So the, there is some value in the continuing ed credit, but not much value in the continuing ed credit. But that's, that's where a lot, you know, Coursera is doing that. 
the courses, all those universities that have joined up with Coursera to offer these courses, what you get is a continuing ed credit out of that. What you get out of Empowered, Empowered is the, the, the new program out of UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. It's continuing ed credit. In fact, I have a friend who used to have a company in Atlanta. He, there's another university well known in the Ivy League called Brown University, and he purchased Brown University's continuing ed program. He, he purchased Brown University, an individual purchased Brown University's continuing ed program, and he now can offer continuing ed programs out of Brown University, and he's the one that benefits. I'm sure part of the deal, Brown still gets some of the money, but he gets Brown University's name to sell his courses. And it's all continuing ed credits, not university credits. So now, University of Phoenix will offer university credits, but uh, you know, a lot of people question the value of the University of Phoenix, but they've grown so much and they've gotten good at what they do. And the more they improve their educational programs and the more they improve the students that come to their educational programs, the more this degree is going to mean something. So that's it. And the other thing that's happening is the different, a lot of people are moving towards diplomas, uh, certificates rather than degree. So, so for example, my department, we offer a master's degree in learning design and technology. We offer a five course certificate in e-learning. We offer a five course certificate for teachers and how to use technology in the classroom. So it's not a full degree, it's five courses. Uh, but, but that, and that's growing. More and more people are off. Instead of a whole degree, something smaller. All right, so online learning is happening. Uh, and what happens when I talk about online learning is people ask me, well, what's better, face-to-face -face or online? And I love that question because I think that it's uh, not a very good question. It really depends upon what you mean by online and face-to-face. -face. So here's... A, a photograph of an, a face-to-face -face classroom. So when you say, is online better than face-to-face, -face, do you mean this classroom? Because I would say this classroom, did you, how many people went to the keynote today on neuro, neuro, uh, whatever it was? Yeah, so, so, anybody? Nobody? One? Uh, so it, 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 it was much like this. Now, I, I got my, my graduate degrees Tell got his undergraduate degree at Virginia Tech. There's a professor at Virginia Tech that teaches geography, and he, he teaches in a, cla in a classroom bigger than this. It holds 3,000 students, and students are banging on the door trying to get into his class. He's incredibly entertaining. He teaches geopolitical issues. He'll have the president of Myanmar on Skype in his class talking, and the students are then able to ask questions of the president of Myanmar in, in this classroom. He, he, people love his class. He's, he's entertaining. It's like going to a show Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in, in this auditorium. So, so is this a bad class? I think it's a bad class. I mean, I took calculus. I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics. I took calculus with 500 of my closest friends. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I, I was motivated to learn math, I liked math, and I just took a lot of notes while the professor would move from one overhead transparency machine to another overhead transparency machine. But was that good teaching and learning? No. Could he have done that online? Could I have had something better online? Absolutely. So is this what you mean by face to face? So I don't like setting up strawman. Strawman is like you say, here's. Here's this horrible face-to-face -face experience, so what's, what's online? Well, here's horrible online. When people want to do an online class, what do they do? They take their course materials and scan them, put them up in their learning management system, tell the students to read this, and then take this multiple choice test. And why do you want to have a multiple choice test? Because then I don't have to grade anything. And it tells you what your score is right away. I love this as a teacher, because I don't have to do anything. I hate it as a student. I mean, it's just the worst. Now, what you do is, is this is your entry point. You get your PDFs up there and you get your tests up there. Then you say, well, I probably ought to do something that feels more like teaching. And so, so then there's, you know, Moodle has discussion for it. So I'm gonna, 
read this, and then I'll add a discussion forum. We'll have a conversation in the discussion forum about this reading, and then do. Or I, I uh, take my PowerPoints. PowerPoint's an awesome tool. Power, PowerPoint, I can just make a bunch of PowerPoints, and I, and I can record audio on it, and I can record that and put that online. Now my lecture's online. So, so, so what we do is we get, we're putting, we're trying to put stuff on. If you really start caring about what it is that your students are experiencing, you really start to figure out what is the content of the class. And that's where we come back to, to open educational resources. Because when you go to teach a class online, you need materials online. And open educational resources is a great place to find those materials. By the way, I would argue that this guy is experiencing distance learning. All right, so, so there, when I talk about online learning, there are tools like Moodle. There are, um, um, th then somebody's got to teach it. You got to have teachers. So you have to some, you have to have a university. You have to have some organization that offers the course. And then, and then you have the content. So those are the three main things that you have in online learning. So let's let's take a look at each of those. The tools, we already talked about that Moodle. Many of you use Moodle. Blackboard, did I hear Blackboard over here? Blackboard, so, so these are the tools. And, you, and there's lots of other tools out there. Uh, and people, you know, at the university, at my university, people find things like, have you ever heard of Pinterest? Pinterest? No? A couple of shaking heads? Well, somebody that finds Pinterest, and Pinterest is a great bookmarking tool, and they say, I wonder how I could use that in the classroom. And so then they figure out really interesting strategies of using Pinterest in their classroom. So, and then I have people who, Google Docs. Anybody ever use Google Documents? What an awesome way of getting kids to collaborate in the classroom, to write things together, to create things together. Great tool. So, so there's lots of tools. So there's tools to be made in the online world. There are also teachers that have to teach. And so the teachers, more and more you have people who've taught face-to-face -face for years that are being asked to, to uh, teach online. And you have universities and schools that are offering these things. And what's happening is people say, you can make a lot of money on tools, you can make a lot of money teaching, so let's, let's go buy Brown University's Continuing Ed Center and that will allow me to teach these classes and me to make money on that teaching. Because when you go to teach the class, you, you charge the students, and, and I, I know in Brazil at, at a public university like this one, you come to school for free. But, but in the United States, you don't. Almost all the universities you have to pay for. And so, so I can offer you a course at, at, uh, uh, at Brown University, charge you $1,000 for that course, and you have 30 students who take that class, so there's $30,000. I'm gonna pay the teacher $2,000 to teach that class. That's $28,000 that I, that I make on the class. So businesses are saying, holy cow, I can make a ton of money on teaching in the teaching area of, of online education. Blackboard, buys everybody. If you get successful with your, your learning management system, what's gonna happen is Blackboard's gonna buy you and then dismantle you. We used to be a WebCT university. Blackboard bought WebCT. They continued to support WebCT for about three years and said, yeah, we're not gonna support that anymore. You should just switch to Blackboard. And the University System of Georgia said, I don't think so. I think we're gonna switch to Desire to Learn. Rumor has it, Desire to Learn is now becoming popular enough that Blackboard's thinking about buying it, and we're gonna be back in the same spot three years from now when they dismantle Desire to Learn, but whatever. So lots of money to be made on tools, lots of money to be made on teaching. These are growth areas, and the other growth area is in content development. And so you have a contrast here. You have people who wanna make money on developing the content, and then you have people like me who work at a public university who believes that if I make stuff for my classes and I'm being paid by a public university, that I ought to take all that content and make that freely available for anyone to use. You have other people who don't believe that, but that's what I believe, that if I'm being paid by the government to be a professor, that I ought, anything that I create, I ought to put online and make freely available for anyone to use. In contrast, you have publishers who, like Pearson, 
Pearson's a multi-billion dollar company. They net, their net income's $1.5 billion a year. They are a huge public, publishing company. What, they're the number one publisher of textbooks in higher education. Now what they said is they, they said, well, we're doing books and books are becoming less and less popular and people are really interested in ebooks, so maybe we should do ebooks. And people are doing e-learning, so maybe we ought to start making interactive content to go along with the textbooks and put that online for people to use. So they're doing that. So they're cre they have textbooks, they have the reading, they have interactive content. And now I've met with a friend of mine who's the vice president of their international division. They've now started buying universities and K through 12 schools so that they can make the money on the teaching end. So they're making money on the content. They own eCollege, which is an LMS. They own Aquella, which is a learning object repository. They own tools, they own content, and now they own schools. So they're going full circle and taking control of the, every aspect of how you can make money in education. So what, what's the competition? Open educational resource. I mean, if we put it out there for free, then what they have is gonna be of less value. All right, so what's out there? in terms of content. This is actually taken from the U.S. Department of Defense. They, they wanted a, a model for uh, content that could be uh, uh, used for education. And, and they have level one through four. I created level zero, because le level zero is, is really just readings. It's not interactive at all. So the first level of, uh, that people typically do is they go after video or narrated PowerPoint. But, but, but there is kind of this level zero, and I, I want to start with level zero because one of the things that I've done is I teach a class on, on learning theories and instructional theories, and I've never really liked the textbooks that are out there. You can buy like a book in cognition. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm stepping in front of you all the time. So, 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 I could never find a textbook. The cognition books were too specific on the information processing models, schemas, and things like that. There really wasn't one that would cover that and project-based learning, and problem-based learning, and case-based learning, and cognitive apprenticeships. The, the, the models that are more instructional and less about how the brain works, but I still want the core theories of Vygotsky and Piaget and information processing. So I wanted a book that did all of those and I couldn't really find one. So I taught one of these face-to-face -face doctoral seminars and I said, we should create an online book that's freely available for people to use. And so in that seminar, we created the first eight chapters of this book. And we made it in HTML, it was in 2001 when we created that. In 2006, we moved it over to a wiki there are now 33 chapters. The chapters were all text. Now there are hundreds of images. There are animations, there are videos, there are other kinds of content in, in the book, and the book's freely available for anyone to use. And so there's the web address at the bottom of this. But that's, and this is a chapter on Vygotsky, and this is sort of an animation showing uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. And so it's a book. I created I've not made any money on it. I looked at the statistics before I left. It's been hit five million times. The most popular chapter is Bloom's Taxonomy of all chapters. And it's, it's had over a million hits. Uh, and so it's a very popular, freely available textbook that's in a wiki. So I like level zero. People need, you know, when you teach an online class, it's good to have read. And so, so having it in a wiki, that's a, if more people did this, there would be lots of textbooks. And some of the sessions that we're going to have here are about creating online textbooks and making them freely available. So the next level is, is videos and narrated PowerPoints. And, and so videos and narrated PowerPoints are interesting, but they're also a lot, we, we are really interested in multicultural perspectives. So you create, one of the things that Tell said is most of those online courses that are out there are not in Portuguese. My wiki, I've had my wiki up since 2001. We've talked about translating it into Portuguese. It's never happened. So it's 33 chapters, all kinds of content, but it has never been translated into Portuguese. So you have a lot of content out there. Well, if you have a video, and if the video, I just stole this, this is an innovation in petroleum at, at 
uh, Unigapi, which is where Tell is. Um, this is just a video. And so videos are pretty easy to create. It takes a little time for the editing. If you do it well, it, it could be pretty costly. Um, but it, it allows you to present content. It allows you to hear from somebody who's knowledgeable in that domain. You can also make videos. This is a video that I did with a, a company that I consult with. And uh, we have sort of flash animations in the background, which all shot on green screen. And, it, and it's a, a, bit, a way of telling stories. And basically, we were using this with K-12 kids, K-5 kids. And so in the video, it poses a problem. And then the kids have to go solve the problem. And so, but it's rich and it's interesting. The kids like the characters and they like watching the videos. It's an interesting story. And then I just grabbed a narrated PowerPoint. And frankly, of these three little screen captures I have, this is incredibly boring. This is really not great. It's really simple to do. I've done them and I can record an hour long one in, in an hour, but boy, is that boring. And, and I don't know how students sit through those, but, but that, that's simple to do. You could do it, but then multicultural, how do you change that? Once it's recorded, how do you change that? How do you make that, how do you make any of these work in Portuguese? Well, you could do captioning, and that's pretty much it. But they're hard to adapt. So the next level up is, is level two. In level two, we're getting into kind of an old psychological theory, B.F. Skinner, uh, and, and programmed instruction. Although Rich tells me it should be personalized learning systems would have been uh, B.F. Skinner's, is that right? Personalized system of instruction. Personalized systems of learning? Instruction. instruction. Uh, personalized systems of instruction. So I knew it as programmed instruction. Program is, this is the most popular strategy that businesses use for delivery training. Why? Because they can take a course. All of my employees need to understand how to protect. I work at a bank. The employees need to protect the bank account numbers and the identities of all the customers at the bank. So I need to teach them how to protect that that data. And so it's compulsory training. I have to get them to train. I can get a, 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 an instructional design firm to go through and create some interactive content that presents it, has graphics to present it, has audio information, has questions that it asks, and they have to answer it. And I can track and make sure that everybody has taken that training. Anybody ever sit through that kind of training before? Yeah, it's awful. I have, we, we, have, we have to do that at the University of Georgia. We have to protect the identities of our students. And as a consequence, the university needs to make sure that every employee goes through that training. And so, so that if you have that embedded in an LMS, you're going to track how much time they spent on it to make sure that they saw every screen. And you're also going to track how they answered the question. Well, ours is not that sophisticated, and so I learned early on that I could just skip the tutorial altogether, just take the test, and the test is almost always so obvious that you could pass it on the first go without ever seeing the content. And that's how I, that's how I take care of my compulsory education. But this is level one, and so it's a step up. It's not too dissimilar from the narrated PowerPoint. You have graphics to lean forward and answer those questions. The next level from that would be something called a branching simulation. And a branching simulation is a lot easier to create than a full-scale simulation, but it, it, it's, it typically has some kind of an audio narration and graphics and text. And you get to the point and you have to make a decision. And depending on which decision you make, the story unfolds differently. So you can change. This, this particular branching simulation is to train U.S. Army chaplains on current uh, strategies for helping people through grief. You may have heard that uh, the U.S. Army is is killing people in Afghanistan and and Iraq. Well, they're also getting killed, and so the chaplains are helping the people who survive through that grief. And so there are uh, much better strategies for dealing with grief, uh, on modern theories of grief therapy. And so that's what this simulation is is about. Is is dealing with that grief, okay? But again, a little more interesting, a little more leaning forward kind of interaction. And again, I also think about how do you adapt this? 
it, it's going to be just as complicated to adapt as this is because you've got to change the language, you've got to change on the screen, you've got to change the audio. It's, it's, there, there are problems in adapting. And then the final level would be uh, full-scale simulations in games. Anybody do anything with games? So here's a game we developed for uh, plant breeding. And so this is a, a, a Mendel's Peas, so that's level one, all the way up to marker assisted selection, which is level five of the game. So you actually get a, 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 a DNA printout to decide which, which uh, plants to one minute. All right, well, I'm probably talking too much anyway. So, and here's another game we did with Disney. Uh, again, uh, it's, we call them serious games, so they're, they're fun. Our rules with Disney have been you have three rules in the design of the game. The first rule is it has to be fun. The second rule is it has to teach something. In this case, it exposes them to some basic geometry. And then the third rule is it has to be fun. Sounds redundant, but, and that, what's happened is when we've worked with them, we probably have designed 100 games with them, and probably 50 of them never saw the light of day. Because they would make it fun, we would try to insert the education, then they'd say it's not fun anymore, then they would change it to be fun, then we had to change it, and they'd go back and forth with us to the point where they say, well, this one's hopeless, we give up. And so, but this one is actually the second most popular game in a world called Club Penguin, um, and it's got math content embedded in the game, unbeknownst to the children. So, so that's, that's kind of an overview of, of all the stuff that you can put online. But then we talk about how do you how do you adapt them for different use? If you you can have games, you can have tutorials, you can have branching simulations, you can have videos, you have narrated PowerPoints, you can put those freely available. Put them under a Creative Commons license and make them freely available for other people to use. Now I used it in my class, it works great in my class. You go to use it in your class and you say, well, I don't like this image, and I don't like it's a, and you have to make adaptations. So, so Tell and I wrote a paper a couple years ago that talked about three strategies for, for making adaptations to the content. And so that's what I wanted to do. And he said, I'm going to put this in here. And I forgot why we put that in here. And I'm running out of time, so uh, I'll just go on. So, so localization. Um, for most people, localization means translating, but it, it's more than translation. It really is. You try to take the content and make it use. If you've used a textbook before, a lot of people say, I've got the textbook, and some people say, okay, we're going to do chapter one, two, three, and go all the way through chapter 15, then we're done the semester. Some people say, yeah, I got this book in eight of the chapters I love, and the rest of them I think are terrible, so for the other ones, I'm going to do something else, and I make adaptations. And so, so that's what you do with online content too, is you, you, you choose the ones you want, and if you can change the things that are there, then you try to change them. So we, we came up with um, uh, two things for localization, loca and, and culture, and the other one is more of a globalization idea, which we call LOMA, um, which we did that when we started this with learning objects, and we kind of moved into the open educational space, and so, uh, Loma Loca are learning objects with cultural affordances, and Loma was learning objects with uh, multi multicultural. Loca is learning objects with cultural adaptations. Loma is learning objects with multicultural affordances. But we've changed it to open educational resources now. And done work as nicely with Loca, Loma, and cultural. Let's, let's take a look at each one of these. So Loca is a localization strategy. So you, again, you're still trying to, you have to translate, but, but, you, but not only do you have to translate, um, you, you need to be able to adapt. And so LOCA, if you can design your system so that you can change things, so that someone's using it can change things easily, that's a great strategy. If you make it a, a, a flash object and it's built it as a Swift file, it's hard to change. If you make it as an HTML object, it's a little bit easier to change. I could put it into uh, an, an editor and I can make changes to it, save it, put it up on my server, and now it's got the things that, in it that I want. So, so if you can choose things that are, are adaptable, that's a good thing. And again, one of the things we talked about in, in this is sometimes it works great when you, when you 
just translate the language, but sometimes it's more than that. And so here's, here's a piece of training that we delivered in Japan. And I was the instructional designer, and I had a graphic artist who was from Brazil. And so I asked the graphic artist to show me a mean guy. So this, this was sales training. So our people, our, which is my company, which is, wants to close the deal with this guy. But the competition, the mean guy, is closing the deal. And so I wanted to portray that visually. So what the graphic artist in Brazil chose to do was to make him kind of scruffy, unshaven. And then I said, I want the, the mean guy, the bad guy, the competition, close the deal by shaking hands with the customer, our target customer. So this is the picture of the danger. Well, we showed that in Japan, and they were uncomfortable with two things. One was that if you, that they've gotten comfortable westernized enough, they've become globalized enough that they're comfortable with sh shaking hands, but they would absolutely never have someone touching, touching their shoulder. That's too intimate, that that, that would be offensive. So in, in their traditional way, they would close the deal by, by, by bowing, but they've been westernized enough that they can shake hands, but they would never touch like that. And that's one issue. The other thing is they would never even have a conversation with somebody who was so unshaven and unkempt. The, the, you know, if that person came to their door, they wouldn't open the door. And so, so our mean guy was too mean for Japan. And so, so the, it, not only did the language not work, we needed the language in Japanese, but it, the images didn't work. So, so those are the things that you face in trying to make these adaptations. And so if the object can change, allow for changes in images and a, in addition to allow changes in, in uh, language, that's a, that's a locus. So if you, and there are some people around the country, or around the world, who are working on strategies for building these kinds of open educational resources and allowing for easy adaptations. You can change that image out, you can change the text out, you can change the audio out. So that would be a, a locus strategy. An end culture strategy would be if you know you're going to deliver it in Japan and you know you're going to deliver it in Brazil, then make sure, and you're going to deliver it in the United States, make sure you have somebody on the team who's from the United States, somebody from Brazil, and somebody from Japan on the design team so that they can represent those three cultures. And that way, when you design it, you're not going to choose to have a picture like this in there because the Japanese person will say, don't have a picture like that. All right? So, that's the idea of end culture. How many cultures? Well, there are 256 countries in the world. So do you design with 256 people? You can, you can, you can also do, you can have two or three different uh, cultures represented on your design team, which I think is a great strategy. The more cultures that are represented, the better. But you also can test it out with the target population and have them react. So you can, show, you can do it in, with some people in Brazil, do it with some people in Japan, do it with some people in the United States. Use that feedback to, to, to help you with your design uh, and including having different people. Well, I, I have an example that we, we did. We did a little math, a rate of change math problem. It's a simple algebra uh, tutorial and, we, and, and we're doing it with a pig farm. Well, pig farming in the United States is pretty popular and so I have a colleague who works in uh, uh, Beirut, Lebanon, and he said that he's working with somebody in Egypt who really wants some math content. So he said, could you send us an example of your math content? So we sent him the pig example, and he said, I can't show this to them. And we said, why? And they said, because Muslims and Jews don't eat pork, and that's most of the people who live in the Middle East. So having a pig farm isn't going to work. In fact, I have a I have a friend who's who's Lebanese. He he had a book. We, have you ever? Is there anything like the Three Little Pigs in Brazil? There's there's like this children's story, the Three Little Pigs. The, that story in 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 uh, Lebanon is still the Three Little Pigs, but they changed it to the Three Little Sheep. And everywhere it said pigs, it was blackened out. So they took the book and changed it to sheep and black, blackened out the pigs. So so pigs don't work. So again, another example of images. If we would have had somebody from the Middle East on our design team, we wouldn't have sent that to them. Loma is, is giving up. Loma is saying, I know there's going to be culture in the things that I create, but let's take that as an opportunity to teach about that culture. So here's a learning object that, that uh, was created up at the University 
uh, the Federal University in Serra, and it's using soccer as an example to teach angles uh, and mathematics. Well, in the United States, we don't really, you know, they have, the, they have a, a, a professional soccer league in the United States. The average attendance at a, at a soccer, professional soccer match is about 18,000 people. The average attendance at my university's football team is 96,000. People in the United States like American football, they don't really like soccer. So, but that doesn't mean you can't use this in the United States. And you can use that as an opportunity to say that most of the people in the world prefer soccer or football than, than American football. And you use that as an opportunity to teach the American kids a different way of, so, so you use the opportunity to, for globalization. And there's a lot of people who've argued that that's a, 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 a great strategy. So in conclusion, well, I have to read my conclusions over here in English. I haven't been turning my pages. So online learning is growing. I think it's growing here. Good online learning has students actively engaged in the content, not just reading PDFs and taking multiple choice tests, uh, that they're actively engaged in doing stuff. Open educational resources have great potential for helping others to enter online teaching. So, so the first thing that you have to do when you go to create an online class is to find content. And open educational resources is a great strategy for finding that content. All right, I'll stop there. If you have any questions, you want my slides or anything, there's my email.